This video is on blood pressure. Blood pressure. And I'll tell you a story of my grandma who went to her favorite store, Walmart, and by the pharmacy in Walmart, there's a blood pressure machine. So she went on, put on the cuff to check her blood pressure and it squeezed the living crap out of her arm and then popped up a number. It said 130 over 90. And she doesn't know what this means. So she comes to me and says, hey grandson, what does this number even mean? And I say, grandma, well, your heart is a pump and it pumps out blood, pumps out blood. And that blood will push against your blood vessels and create pressure. Pressure just means force over an area, literally force over this area. And so the pressure your blood makes is called your blood pressure. And when it pumps, when it pumps, when your heart contracts and pumps, we call that systole. We call that systole. And a ton of blood will shoot out and create a really high pressure. That's your first number. We call that systolic because it matches with systole. So it'll pump and push out all this blood and then it will relax. Your heart will relax. We call that diastole. And when your heart relaxes, that pressure will drop and that's your lower number. We call this diastolic. Diastolic, meaning diastole. And that measures the pressure in your vessels when you contract and when you relax. And my grandma says, okay, I kind of understand this now, but what is, is this good? Is it bad? Is this high blood pressure? Is it low blood pressure? I mean, I hear all these things about high blood pressure being bad. Is this high blood pressure? You said, no, that's, that's not within the normal range. And you don't want too high blood pressure because you can imagine there's too much pressure. It can damage your blood vessels. You don't want too low blood pressure because you won't be able to have enough pressure to perfuse all your limbs and all your organs. So you want to be in that range. And lucky for my grandma, she is in that range. Now your blood pressure fluctuates and what controls your blood pressure? Well, I said if blood pressure is due to blood being pumped and hitting these vessels, then what controls your blood pressure is gonna be the amount of blood being pumped. Cardiac output. Cardiac output affects blood pressure. What's cardiac output? You know I'm gonna ask you, what's cardiac output? If you said cardiac output equals heart rate, times stroke volume, you'd be absolutely right. If you said stroke volume, it's further subdivided into preload, afterload, and contractility, you'd be even more right. Well done. Well then, all these things can affect the blood pressure. Preload, we said, is filling, more volume, more fluid. Yeah, so if you increase preload, if you increase the amount of blood in your vessel, what do you think that'll do? Increase blood pressure. Increase blood pressure, makes sense. If you decrease preload, if you only have like a drop of blood in this massive vessel, do you think that'll be a lot of pressure? No, of course not. So if you decrease preload, you decrease the amount of blood in your vessels, then you have decreased blood pressure. Okay, and we can artificially kind of control this. For, so, for example, if someone is hypotensive, they come in with really low blood pressure, then we give them fluids. Give them IV fluids, right? We try and raise back that amount of preload, raise back that amount of blood so we can increase our blood pressure. That's exactly what we do. If someone comes in with really, really high blood pressure, we're gonna try and decrease that amount of fluid, decrease that preload, decrease that preload. And that's what a lot of our drugs do, diuretics, yeah? Makes you pee out all that fluid. And that's how we can externally kind of manipulate it with our medicines and our pharmaceuticals and stuff. But our body does it also. Our body does it naturally. Uh, when, your, when your organs feel too much pressure, they will react. If they feel too little pressure, they will react, especially your kidneys, because your kidneys help filter your blood. And they will react very strongly via the RAS pathway. All right. I'm not gonna go into the RAS pathway, I already went through it in my uh, renal video, so I'll put a link in the description and you can check it out on your own. But that's how you can control your preload. How about your afterload? How about your afterload? What is your afterload, by the way? Night resistance? And we said that the biggest kind of cause of resistance is uh, constriction and dilation. When you constrict your vessel, when you make this vessel really, really small, you really increase that resistance. Your, your blood has to push against this very, very narrow lumen. So vasoconstrict equals increased afterload. And all that blood has to push against this lumen. Push, push, push. And that increases blood pressure. Increases blood pressure, okay? Now what's the opposite? Let's vasodilate. Let's make this vessel nice and big. Now you have all the room in the world 
your blood has all the room in the world. It doesn't have to push against it so hard. So in vasodilation, you will decrease afterload, and that will decrease blood pressure. Okay. Now contractility is your heart beating harder, beating harder. And it was one of the, the main ways it does that. That was due to increased sympathetic activity via beta-1. With the beta-1 increases your funny sodium channels, increases your calcium, um, and that increases your heart rate. And by increasing calcium, that also increases your contractility because muscles need calcium to contract. And so this increases your heart rate, increases your contractility. Great recap in all our previous videos, right? Uh, now what's the opposite? How do you decrease your heart rate? How do you decrease contractility? Be your parasympathetic activity. Parasympathetic. Uh, boom, 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 boom. All right, para equals decrease heart rate. Decrease contractility. Or you can just give a beta blocker. Okay, but there's another way. Whoops. Now we can control all this with medicines and pharmaceuticals, give them vasodilators, vasoconstrictors, give them beta blockers, beta agonists, all this stuff. But your body has a way of controlling it naturally. On a day-to-day -day basis, our body is what controls our blood pressure natu naturally. If we need higher blood pressure, it'll do that. If we need lower, it'll do that. It's very, very smart. One I want to talk about is dealing with contractility and the sympathetic, parasympathetic in particular. In particular, in your blood vessels, you have these receptors that monitor our pressure. These are called baroreceptors. Baroreceptors. Baro means pressure, so it literally means pressure receptors. You're, you have receptors in your blood vessels that sense pressure. Here's your heart, here's your aortic arch, and your aortic arch gives rise to your subclavians and your, and your carotids, right? Here's your carotids. There's a baroreceptor right in the aortic arch, which we call the aortic baroreceptor. There's a baroreceptor in your carotids, and this little dilation of your carotids called the carotid sinus, called your carotid baroreceptor. Carotid baroreceptors. And these baroreceptors will have nerves attached to them. And these nerves will combine and connect to larger, more important nerves. The aortic one connects to the vagus nerve. Sorry, vagus. Because if you recall, your vagus nerve descends and falls down onto this area. So it will collect and connect to your vagus nerve. Your carotid sinus will also have little nerves attached to them that will connect to the glossopharyngeal nerve. That's cranial nerve 9. Vagus nerve is cranial nerve 10. Right. And both of these will eventually reach your medulla. The solitary nucleus of the medulla. And they monitor pressure, they monitor pressure. When there's increased pressure, it will literally stretch, stretch these muscles. Stretch the muscles, stretch the receptor. And when they stretch the muscles, stretch the receptor, they open ion channels and they will depolarize. Stretch equals depolarize. And they will depolarize and they will start sending signals the more you stretch, the more they depolarize. The more they depolarize, the more they send signals. So they start sending signals really, really fast. Increase signals. And your brain will say, whoa, 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 whoa. That's way too much pressure. That's way too much stretch. I gotta slow this down. I gotta decrease this amount of pressure. How does it decrease this amount of pressure? It will decrease sympathetic activity. And by doing that, we decrease our, our heart rate, rate, we decrease our blood pressure. And you can actually do this on somebody, don't, but you can. If you push it on your carotids, if you push on your carotids, it will stretch your carotids. Stretch and cause depolarization, cause firing, and your brain will think, will think it's due to increased blood pressure. We'll say, whoa, 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 that's a lot of firing, that must be a lot of blood pressure, and it will start to drop your heart rate. So if you do a carotids massage, 
is literally the same thing as increased blood pressure. You will have that decreased heart rate, you will have that decreased blood pressure. And if you do it too much, you can actually pass out. So these pe people that have like really tight collars or wearing really tight neckties that push against the crowd, push too much until their blood pressure, heart rate drops so much they pass out. Okay. Now let's reset. Let's say your blood pressure is really low. Low blood pressure. Low blood pressure. If your pressure drops, then nothing's stretching your receptors anymore. Nothing's stretching your muscles, nothing's stretching your receptor, and those ion channels don't open. So you have no firing. You have no firing. They're just kind of lying there. They're just, nothing's, nothing's stimulating them. No firing. Or decreased firing. I just didn't say no firing. Decreased firing. And your body will sense that decreased firing and say, whoa, I have too little blood pressure. I need to pump that back up. I need to pump that back up. How do I do that? By increasing sympathetic firing. Increasing sympathetic firing. By doing that, we increase our heart rate, increase our contractility, increase our blood pressure. That's it. That is actually all I want to talk about for blood pressure. There's one more topic. Uh, you can skip this if you like, or you can flag it and come back to it. And that is pulse pressure. That is pulse pressure. I say you can come back to this video if you like because we're gonna talk about some, some pathology that we haven't touched on yet. So it might not be fair to you, but if you wanna stick around for it, by all means. Pulse pressure. Just equals your systolic pressure minus your diastolic. And it's really, really proportionate to the systolic pressure. All right. Let's just use my grandma's blood pressure, for example, 130 over 90. You take the difference, your pulse pressure would be 40, right? If we increase systolic blood pressure, if we increase the amount of blood that gets into our vessels and pushes against our wall, if we increase this, let's say now it's 200. If we increase this, and that increases our pulse pressure. Now our pulse pressure is 110. Right. So it really depends on your systolic pressure, the amount of blood that you're getting into your vessels during contraction, during contraction. So let's see what causes increased pulse pressure. You're going to have things from increased cardiac output because that pumps more blood into your vessels, like increased heart rate, increased stroke volume. There's one that says, uh, there's one in first aid that says hyperthyroidism. That's, that's so wonky. Hyperthyroidism causes you to have increased heart rate. That's basically what they're trying to say. So I'll write it down, but <laughs> I, I, that's just trying to fool you for no, no good reason. So hyperthyroidism is a big one. You can have really stiff aortas. If your vessel's really stiff, then uh, that's increased resistance, that's increased afterload. You're pumping against this really stiff vessel, that just increases your pressure, your systolic pressure when you're pumping out, okay? And then there's one more, there is aortic regurge. All right, again, we're gonna talk about this in a future video, but an aortic regurge, your aortic valve isn't all the way closed, so blood will leak back and enter your left ventricle and it will fill this. You will have increased filling, increased preload. And then the next time it'll contract, it'll push out even more blood and you'll have a rise in your systolic. All right. That has increased pulse pressure. How about decreased pulse pressure? Decreased pulse, pulse pressure. <laughs> decreased pulse pressure is due to a decrease in your systolic, usually. When you decrease your systolic, let's make this 100, you decrease your pulse pressure. So now your pulse pressure would be 10, right? So if you decrease your systolic, you just decrease your pulse pressure. So anything that decreases your systolic pressure, the, the amount of blood that gets pumped out and pushes against these vessels during contraction will decrease your pulse pressure. So how about low output? How about if you are dehydrated or you're hemorrhaging or you have just low volume, low output? How about heart failure where you can't pump the blood out? How about aortic stenosis here your valves are stenosed difficult to open so when you try and pump barely any blood comes out systolic drops pulse pressure drops decrease 
pulse pressure. Again, there's a lot of pathology we haven't talked about yet, so you might flag this video and come back to it, but if you get the gist of it, I think it'll help you in the long run, especially when they're talking about increased pulse pressure, decreased pulse pressure, pulse pressure, you won't get lost in the terminology. That does it for this video, I hope you enjoyed, thanks.